If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network. Internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Hey, this is John Preston, Marine Combat Veteran and Pacific Records Recording Artist. i just reaching out to have you check out our new album, Battle Cry, Sons of America's Heroes, an album featuring phenomenal other combat veteran artists like Scott Brown of the Scooter Brown Band, Brian Weaver, Rowdy Johnson, just an incredible mix of people. This is all veterans telling our stories and our lives, and we're giving 100% of our proceeds to the Valkyrie Initiative to help veterans and first responders integrate back into society. I, myself, I've battled with post-traumatic stress for many years and lost my own brother, a Marine Corps veteran, to suicide. I ask that you step with us and make this happen. We are in pre-order right now and release on March 17th. Go to iTunes, go to Amazon, buy, buy, buy. We plan on making the charts and making it at a very high level, and your support right now makes a difference. This is the release of my new song, Superman Falls, which is actually about the loss of my own brother, which happened last year, and I would love for everyone to check it out, to listen, and hopefully it'll make a difference in many lives. If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now, and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. 687. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable everyday carry or a tough as nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. Sometimes riders feel lost, unsure why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our riding into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable riders to develop and grow, offering manuscript critiques and line edits through a mentoring editorial style. We also offer assistance on generating a rider's bio for your websites. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your riding into maturity. For a full list of services, visit blackwolfeditorial.com.
Here's George Foreman with InventHelp. Hi, I'm George Foreman. Do you have an idea for a new product or invention? People ask me all the time, George, how do I get my idea in front of companies? How do I get a patent? What do I do next? Do you have the same questions? I'll tell you like I'll tell them all. Call my friends at InventHelp. Call InventHelp today for free information. InventHelp has been helping inventors for more than 30 years and has sales offices nationwide. InventHelp can submit your invention to companies who are interested in receiving new ideas. If you have an idea and want to try to patent it and submit it to companies, you should call InventHelp today for free information. Listen, I can't guarantee a company will be interested in your idea, but I believe every inventor deserves the opportunity to step into the ring and take their best shot. Put InventHelp in your corner. Get your free inventor's information. Call 1-800-353-6490. That's 1-800-353-6490. Again, 1-800-353-6490. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We've been given authorization to push back from the terminal. At this time, I'd like to welcome you aboard flight FU-2 from United Airlines. Rest assured, at this point in time, the no beating of the passengers sign is currently lit. So we we do at this time want to make sure that the flight attendants are aware there will be no beating of passengers on this flight. I'm not ready to end the I've been through hell and I don't have time to go round and round and round It's too late to turn back now You know I wouldn't if I could Cause I'm proud as hell I can't bring myself to do what it is You think I should All right, folks, that lousy attempt at an improv was brought to you by yours truly. Good evening. This is the Jen and Rick Show. I'm one half of the crew, Mr. Rick Robinson, coming to you live from klrnradio.com. And I am currently um, joined by my co-host, who is probably hiding her head in shame right now. Good evening, Miss Jen. How are you? <laughs> Hi, I'm doing well. How are you? Uh, well, I was doing okay till I had this bright idea to try to make a funny and realized I didn't plan it out well enough. So it kind of fell fat, but it fell flat. But it didn't. Oh really my did. gosh, I thought it was funny. I yeah. thought it was really funny. Maybe I'm just, heard... I'm too hard on myself. Maybe who knows? Oh, absolutely. Hey, I've heard that the South. You know, um, anybody that's ever ridden Southwest. They are a little unconventional with their safety speeches, and they often say things that are current about, you know, just like they comment on current events going on, and they make a lot of jokes, and the staff has a lot of fun with it. So I've heard that the Southwest staff people have been a lot of jokes about all of this. Oh, yes. Like, they, they, they you absolutely. know, saying like, oh, and hey, everybody, uh, so we're going to need four passengers to go ahead and volunteer whether you want to or not. <laughs> just kidding, you know, or whatever. And making people making people laugh, making fun of the United situation. Well, yeah, no, actually, I I know a couple of uh, flight attendants because I actually used to work for Southwest, and I I know for a fact they've been having fun with it all day today. There was actually a meme that got put out by some Southwest staff that said, "Thank you for choosing Southwest Airlines, the airline that strives to beat our competition, not our passengers." <laughs> yeah, I liked that. <laughs> yeah, I saw one that similar thing. They said like beat. We'll beat prices, not you. <laughs> and I thought that was great. I am. Ah, I'm just annoyed with the whole situation. I mean, look, here, here's the thing from a customer service perspe perspective. And it's interesting that this came up today because there's been a lot of news coverage lately about customer service and the, the impact of uh, things like Amazon Prime and other things that allow you to basically order stuff online and have it shipped to your home. They're actually winning the war against the stores, but the folks are, that are, you know, watching the numbers and looking at the analytics are talking about the fact that, you know, honestly, the stores could beat them if they would only focus more on customer service. But that's the thing. As someone who has spent the last 20, what am I, 43 now? I started my own private security firm when I was 24. 
So for the last 19 years in one form or another, I have been involved in customer service. That, because that's the thing that nobody talks about. Whether you're running a business, whether you work in a retail store, whether you work in a call center, no matter what you're doing, if you interact with the public at all, your primary focus should be customer service. And that's what these people that were talking about, you know, the fact that Amazon is kind of uh, causing a lot of folks to reshift their focus, downsize their stores, work on what they were going to do. They're missing the mark because... The, they have the opportunity to win people over with good customer service, but we don't hire from that perspective anymore. And this this proves it because with as cutthroat as everything is in the airline industry today, the last thing these people should have done was turn something into a media event that was really pretty simple. Because how every other airline does it, and I don't know how United does it. I've never I, well, actually, I take that back. That no, I did not fly them to go to CPAC. That was Delta. Most of my flights have. When I've flown, have been Southwest. Now, I flew a lot when I was a kid, but my dad always picked those, and I don't remember if United was ever one of them that we flew. If if I was, I don't actually remember it. But the thing that this, that this drives home is the, the overall lack of customer service because there, there would have and there should have been a way to make this happen without ultimately the guy b being dragged off the plane. Now, I get it. There's more to the story. There's been uh, news stories that have come out now where apparently after he was um, – escorted off the plane the first time he snuck back on etc but there should have been no reason why someone who was a paying customer on a flight was forcibly removed from their seat i'm sorry that that should not happen i don't care what the justification was that should not happen i keep doing that i keep meeting myself so you won't hear me clear my throat and everything and I forget to unmute it um <laughs> I it, that that is the whole thing here. I've heard a lot of people try to compare this to, oh well, you know there are a lot of times where like people are denied boarding. He was boarded. Everybody was boarded, and actually Sean Davis over at the Federalist did a pretty good breakdown of United's policy as it's written. That's available at least, and um, what these kinds of things mean, how they would handle them, or what you know, what they would do in a situation where they need a sea like that. This was not an overbooked flight. It was not oversold. That is a different situation. It was said a lot at first because people didn't know at first that it was crew members that they needed the seats for. So it was not oversold. It was a completely full flight of paying customers. They needed four seats for crew members, and they just handled this completely terribly. If they had even 30 minutes earlier before boarding the flight had started calling passengers up, as has often happened at other, you know, at other, um, uh, on other flights, I've had it happen at other airports, people that are going to have a very close connecting flight or something like that, they'll say, you know, would you want to go ahead and move to this next flight? You'll for sure make the next connector, da 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 And and a lot of times people will take something depending on on what it is. And lots of airlines just keep offering. You don't just stop offering. But this is still so different. This isn't like he was in standby and then like you know, bullied his way onto the plane or something and they were making him leave because it was rightfully someone else's seat. Like, this is the seat he paid for. I know that things happen. I know that sometimes flights get canceled. There's plane maintenance. There's weather. Um, all sorts of things you can't control. This was something that could be controlled and they just handled this about as poorly as you possibly could. When no one would volunteer, they upped the ante a little bit. And then when no one would volunteer after that, they randomly select someone. I would really like to know who would, having planned this flight the way that you did, and if, especially if you had a job to get back to the next day or whatever, who would actually just be like, Oh, well, you know, United told me I have to be, I mean, you would be indignant that out of all the passengers, you know, you were one of the people that was told it doesn't matter whether you want to or not, we are going to make you leave this plane. That is just such a terrible way to treat a paying customer. I don't care what, I don't care what the deal is. I don't care if he is a nice man or a mean man or has this stupid background that has nothing to do with this flight and the police and United would not have known this background at all. So that's not a good justification. And it doesn't, it doesn't have anything to do with how he was treated on this flight. But it's just insane to me how many people are being very knee jerk, um, defensive of the authoritarians here. 
um, and acting like, well, if he just would have complied, then, you know, this wouldn't have been a problem. So it's really all his fault. Uh, no, they created the problem to which he refused to comply with their solution. And as far as I'm concerned, once you've boarded that plane and actually, according to United's um, manual, everything or policy, everything should happen pre boarding, not once on board and then pulling someone off unless they willingly go. So all of this could have been avoided had the airline from the jump done taken a complete different direction with this or at least adjusted along the way at no point in time did a man who was not posing any sort of threat to anyone nor being disruptive and just sitting there in his paid seat is not being disup disruptive just because he refused to leave when told for no reason to leave um should they be forcibly removing someone like that it's just absolutely insane to me well here's the thing as um and for those of you that have been listening for a while, you know this. I was a Southwest employee. I un I do know a lot about airline policies and procedures. I know they vary from airline to airline. But here's something that, that kind of struck me when I – because at first, because the, when the news first started talking about it, because I heard it first thing this morning as I was waking up, even they were talking about it being an oversold flight. And then as the new, as the story came out later in the day that it was actually just a fully booked flight and they needed – seats for staff members there's one thing that and, and again i'm really not trying to give southwest a commercial here they do not pay us for any advertising but there's one thing that i know for a fact <laughs> I, there's one thing that i know for a fact southwest will do because i have been removed from a flight before as a non-rev passenger because i work for them any staff member who is on the flight whether it is to deadhead to get to another place to make sure that they can be to work on time or whatever the case may be always takes secondary position to a paying customer that is how it should be the one thing that that is stuck with me from the first day that i set foot into southwest airlines was the fact that they had this this practice that seems really really small at first until you realize what it means. Anytime they write the word customer, whether it's in a manual, whether it's in a report, whether it's in the documentation for the tickets when they do the online or the reservations through the call center, the, the word customer is capitalized, period, because the customer comes first. United failed that in so many ways, and I, for one, will never fly them if I can help it ever. Now, there are times when certain radio stations want to pay for me to go places, and when they do that, I got to kind of fly where they send me or who they send me through. But if I can help it, if I'm the one booking the flight, based on this poor customer service, I will never fly United Airlines because I don't know if I'm going to be the guy that gets dragged off the flight. <laughs> Well, I, I'll tell you, I'm kind of the opposite. I'm like, you know what? I am probably flying in a couple of weeks, and I just may fly United because they're going to be on the best behavior they've ever been on in this in this uh, foreseeable future. But I, I do think that one of the other major missteps, and, you know, people make mistakes. So companies make mistakes because people make mistakes, and that's part of humanity. That is, that's going to happen. Um, the to me, where it went even more wrong was doubling down. The tweets that were put out by United, then the initial letter to employees and staff from the CEO that was, you know, passed around, um, and then the unwillingness to deliver an apology um, and say and, def and to defend even after these video after video after video is coming out where this is obvious that this was not someone who was combative, um, this was not someone fighting anybody, um, that they refused to apologize until today. That should have been very immediate. Um, I don't know if the apology is just lip service or not. I mean, it sounded like a pretty dang good statement about what they were going to actively do in order to ensure something like this never happens again. But... Um, I, I was going to say, I am definitely not in the industries I've worked. Uh, I am definitely not a the customer is always right type person. I am not. And in fact, a lot of the times I will be skeptical of the customer and I will be siding with the business just because of the nature of the industries I've worked in. But um, there's just times where things are wrong. And it doesn't matter whether it was within their right to do so as a company and that the plane was private property so no one's he was asked to leave he's trespassing so he's breaking the law all this crazy crap everybody's come up with to defend uh, 
the police and the United staff basically, you know, acting like cattle wranglers. So I think that, you know, it's it's not that. It's it's not about whether it was legal or within their right. It's about doing something that is right and handling a situation professionally. And I, I've see, also seen a lot of people say that, like, well, it only got violent because he refused to comply. This was not a man who was running from the police, who was harboring a weapon, who was break, getting caught breaking into a car, who was assaulting another human being. This is not someone who was engaged in criminal activity that the police were pursuing and refused to comply with whatever their instructions were. And so then he got taken down and injured. This is a guy who has done nothing wrong except for show up for his flight on time board his plane with the ticket that he paid for and sat there. And then he's being told basically through no fault of his own that he is going to be removed from this flight, but everyone else gets to stay. That is something that I don't even know how you can compare the two situations in complying. Would most people probably go ahead and just get up and go, you know what, and I'm filing a report and I want to see your supervisor and I'm going to make sure that everybody knows how terrible this was of you to do. Yeah, I think a lot of people probably would have gone that route and would not have stuck to their guns as much as this man did. But I, I don't know. I There's just no way that you can convince me that he was just some entitled, spoiled brat who didn't comply so he got what he deserved i mean that is basically a lot of what i've been seeing and that is insane to me like i said this is not somebody who was engaged in any sort of criminal act or who had even anything questionable going on he was just picked at random to be booted and the treatment is abhorrent united has multiple ways that they could have that they can offer things or talk to other passengers and figure out another way to go about removing enough people from the plane. Or, hey, how about this? You figure out something else for your crew. I know that that stinks, but that you did not prepare for them to be on this flight in the first place. And so therefore, to have to get cops involved and drag a man out uh, almost unconscious and with blood running down his face is, somehow the best alternative no i i i just you can't convince me that um you know that he brought this upon himself and that they were just doing what companies should get to do that's absolutely insane no i completely agree um and for those of you who may have heard a bit of background noise i was trying to play beavis yelling breaking the law but it didn't work out so well because there, <laughs> there was chainsaw noise there too so it was pretty muffled but anyway um i thought i had the audio clip for it and i guess i had the wrong one all right so anyway i mean you know again you know i understand the customer is not always right i mean again i worked private security for 13 years there were plenty of times that i would go toe to toe with one of my clients over something because they were technically my customer and they would be basically asking me to have my staff break the law which i told them i wasn't comfortable with so i mean i get the customer is not always right but in this particular instance especially when it's something as simple as they didn't have enough seats for a couple of employees that were needing to be on the plane. There were other ways to deal with that without basically causing someone to be forcibly removed from an airplane. It, it just leaves a it leaves a bad taste in everybody's mouth. And I think uh, from what I've seen, I don't know if these are photoshopped or not, but some people have been showing some pictures of what appears to be a graphic representing United stock. And I think most of their stockholders currently agree with my opinion, which is that they shouldn't have done that. But it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't this this was just a total fail on all fronts and then they just kept making it worse. I mean, at the point where you tell someone they're going to if they don't get off the plane for having done absolutely nothing wrong, but just because you said so, because you want that seat for someone else, um, that they rightfully paid for, that 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 you're gonna get the police to bring them off and the person says, No, I'm not leaving that's the point where you back off and you try to find another customer. This person, if I think they thought they were going to scare him and then he was just going to go. And, you know, most people, that probably would have been the case. I just, they, 
the fact that they would even have to get police involved um, should have told them already that they were going too far. He wasn't doing anything that needed police involvement except for just not moving. <laughs> so that should have told them that they'd gone too far. And then in addition to this, they ended up having to deplane to clean up his blood. They deep they they took everyone off the plane to clean up his blood. Supposedly part of the reason that this crew had to be on this flight and they had to remove people from it was so that they could make some connection. Well, the flight didn't leave for two hours, so they certainly didn't make that connection. So it was all for naught, basically. But not only that, but so security escorts him off the plane. Police, it's all been kind of convoluted about exactly who was doing that. I mean, I know there was a police written on the back of a jacket, but um, apparently there's a few different kind of security measures there. So they take him off the plane at some point lose him in the terminal and he runs back onto the plane and just who allowed him to run back on i mean and then i hear people talking about that saying well he's lucky if he doesn't get charged with an act of terrorism i'm like are you kidding you're still gonna blame the guy for that and and there's videos of that too and he seems extremely disoriented he's just saying i just need to go home i just need to go home i just need to go home and he is kind of looking around and people are kind of trying to talk to him and he's just kind of standing there very disheveled and going I, I have to go home it's all very bizarre so i i don't understand that seems like a lot of incompetency on the security aspect if they got him off the plane but then lost him and he got back on the plane somehow who was watching the door? It's just all such a crazy story, and United is uh, going to pay. Oh, they're going to pay handsomely, I'm sure. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> by the time this is all said and done, the dude's probably going to be able to retire if he wants to. Um, so, I yeah, mean, there, certainly. There, I mean, there is that. There's, there's always at least one good side, uh, or good side. Um, not really, but anyway. Uh, so I think we have about run that topic as far as yes. it's going to go. Um, so some interesting things happened uh, Thursday right before you and I went on the air, and they've been kind of convoluting ever since, and that is this whole Syria situation. Um, got anything you want to talk about with that that you've noticed over the last few days? I'm sorry, say that again? You cut out just a bit. Which situation? Uh, the situation in Syria, you know, with the whole cruise missile. Stuff. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, uh, you know, I just still don't know what to make of it. I am typically anti getting involved in something else like this that could just be, uh, you know, cripple us for years to come. Um, I think that it's like... It's hard to tell if it was just some sort of like show of power and a warning, but it really didn't do much. So I'm not sure that that worked other than just telling the world we will, which, you know, OK. Um, but uh, all the people that it could, I just I don't know all the ways that this could make it a really big mess for us. And then um, the kind of brazenness of now Trump tweeting some other things. I'm hoping that it didn't give him kind of the gusto to think that okay and now north korea you're next which is kind of what he said so yeah Actually, i don't know he, he was saying that before but if i may it's tinfoil hat time <laughs> all right so there have been a lot of things that have happened in regards to the serious situation and honestly um i've, I've talked about this a bit but i kind of want to get your take on it here because there were some interesting things that happened in regards to Syria with this uh, Cuban, uh, I almost said Cuban missile, with the, <laughs> the cruise missile strike. So interesting thing, because for the last couple of weeks, Trump has been making noise about unilaterally being willing to, to move against North Korea, and nobody believed him. So while Trump is sitting down to dinner with the leader of China, he's throwing cruise missiles into Syria. So not only does he have... The, the cojones to be stand, sitting across from a major world leader while he's ordered military action. It also puts North Korea right back into both of their faces because this is the same guy who has been for weeks saying he was willing to move against North Korea on his own and nobody really believed him until he unilaterally moved against Syria on his own and now suddenly uh, 
Z of China actually believes him. Now, side note, I'm curious, did they have the double Big Mac, Big Mac at this dinner that Trump promised he was going to buy instead of the steak? Somehow I doubt it, but... Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. I did forget about that point of it, though, is that, you know, some of it is it wasn't just show to the whole world, but show to, um, you know, the person he was breaking bread with. It, it, a little well, bit, of, a little bit of muscle flexing, and and it goes even further because look at what's happened to the news cycle. For the, up until today, when Spicer stepped in it again, we hadn't been talking about anything but Syria. Never mind the fact that there have been actual, honestly, even Tillerson on the Sunday shows, kind of tertiarily admitted that they were pretty sure the Russians were involved in. Influencing, influencing our election because he admitted they'd been doing it in other countries. Nobody's been talking about that because we've been too busy talking about Syria. Nobody's been talking about the brother or the son-in-law of Trump's that was actually uh, being brought in or drawn into light about possible connections with Russia, etc. Because of the fact that we've been talking about Syria. He's also in one fell swoop showed the world that we are not going to put up with anybody doing anything crazy. And at the same time proven that he is nuts enough to go unilaterally against a country like North Korea if nobody else is willing to go with him. So this is my, and again, my tinfoil hat moment. This seems to be another instance of Trump literally playing chess while everybody else has been playing checkers. Because in one fell swoop, he changed the complete scope of the conversation, got China's attention, put uh, North Korea right back in everybody's forefront, and took care of the fact that Assad apparently thought he could continue to use chemical weapons against his own people. Now, that being said, it's all about the blow up on her faces, but for, for just about 30 seconds, it looked like a masterful stroke. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, I think that's pretty fair to say. And I, and I do think that a lot of people uh, on various sides uh, were, in even if they didn't really <laughs> know why, were a little bit like fist pumping and like saying, yes, like finally, because... You know, we, we did deal with a president that um, for eight years ignored some of these situations, placated them, tried to do the diplomatic thing. And unfortunately, it made some of these areas worse than what they are now, even though there was no bloodshed on our part. And, you know, Americans didn't have to get involved you know, personally, um, and there were some strikes, some airstrikes and some drones, you know, there was some of that stuff, but there was never any follow through or follow up and things were just allowed to keep going on as they are. So I think there were a lot of people that were just kind of glad that no matter what to just see someone put their money where their mouth was. We have officially gone past the bottom of the hour break, so we're going to have to take a quick break real quick. And when we come back, we actually have some breaking news that just came across my Twitter feed that I think is kind of relevant to what we've been discussing. So this is June and Rick. We'll be back here in about four minutes. Don't go away. I'm not ready to end the fight. I'm not ready to back down. Because I've been through hell and I don't have... You're listening to the Spark Radio Network. Internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Hey, this is John Preston, Marine Combat Veteran and Pacific Records Recording Artist. Hi, just reaching out to have you check out our new album, Battle Cry, Songs of America's Heroes, an album featuring phenomenal other combat veteran artists like Scott Brown of the Scooter Brown Band, Ryan Weaver, Rowdy Johnson, just an incredible mix of people. This is all veterans telling our stories and our lives, and we're giving 100% of our proceeds to the Valkyrie Initiative to help veterans and first responders integrate back into society. I, myself, I've battled with post-traumatic stress for many years and lost my own brother, a Marine Corps veteran, to suicide. I ask that you step with us and make this happen. We are in pre-order right now and release on March 17th. Go to iTunes, go to Amazon, bye, bye, bye. We plan on making the charts and making it at a very high level, and your support right now makes a difference. This is the release of my new song, Superman Falls, which is actually about the loss of my own brother, which happened last year, and I would love for everyone to check it out, to listen, and hopefully it'll make a difference in many lives. 
If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now, and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable everyday carry or a tough as nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. Sometimes riders feel lost, unsure why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our riding into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable riders to develop and grow, offering manuscript critiques and line edits through a mentoring editorial style. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's file for your websites. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services, visit blackwolfeditorial.com. Here's George Foreman with InventHelp. Hi, I'm George Foreman. Do you have an idea for a new product or invention? People ask me all the time, George, how do I get my idea in front of companies? How do I get a patent? What do I do next? Do you have the same questions? I'll tell you like I'll tell them all. Call my friends at InventHelp. Call InventHelp today for free information. InventHelp has been helping inventors for more than 30 years and has sales offices nationwide. InventHelp can submit your invention to companies who are interested in receiving new ideas. If you have an idea and want to try to patent it and submit it to companies, you should call InventHelp today for free information. Listen, I can't guarantee a company will be interested in your idea, but I believe every inventor deserves the opportunity to step into the ring and take their best shot. Put InventHelp in your corner. To get your free inventor's information, call 1-800-353-6490. That's 1-800-353-6490. Again, 1-800-353-6490. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. I'm not ready to back down because I've been through hell and I don't have time to go around. It's too late to turn back now You know I wouldn't if I could Cause I'm proud as hell I can't bring myself to do what it is You think I should all right, folks, welcome back. This is Jim Rick. We're coming to you live right now from KLRNRadio.com. Already into the bottom half of the show. My, oh, my, where does the time go? Before we change gears, uh, Miss Jen had one closing statement she wanted to make about Syria. So just in general, anything over there, my whole deal is that we have had so many situations that should have been addressed um, by at least some sort of uh, international cooperation. And we have something in place that's supposed to do some of this. And there's been lots of conventions signed and all sorts of treaties made that they will uphold these certain things. And they look to the United States to basically fund most of it. So dismantle the UN. They have refused to step in on this. They refused to step in in Darfur when genocide, you know, and call it genocide. Um, they 
it, stop sending them billions of dollars. Let's stop giving them our technology, weaponry, intel. You know, they're useless. They refuse to call on members to defend people from years of attacks using weapons deemed illegal by the international com community. You know, the community that they designed, that they wrote the these policies for. It's absolutely ridiculous. They've avoided calling genocide genocide. And in order, I, I guess just in order to placate guilty or otherwise dangerous players in the region, it's this is partially their fault if they're going to be this governing body of the global community, but then they refuse to do so. Then we go in and clean up some things or have to go strong arm somebody and everybody gets mad at us for it. So it's really kind of, <clears throat> it's just a worthless organization at this point. They sit there and they beat their own chest and they point at the U.S. and wag their finger and uh, they continue to, in a lot of ways, appease radical Islam. And I'm over it. We should dismantle them now. Well, yeah, I mean, I agree. And I, I don't know how much of it actually has to do with... Um them trying to appease Islam. I think another explanation I have for it is, if you'll notice, the UN kind of became a lot more impotent when Russia became part of the UN Security Council. Well, yes, but there's just been ongoing things for a long time. Like they didn't, when when Turkey was trying to become members of various organizations, they were uh, tippy-toeing around any of the dealings of people that they, Turkey was still dealing with Iran. Turkey was still having uh, positive relations and harboring some, I mean, there were all these things going on that we were turning the other cheek. They were ignoring because they didn't want to piss them off basically. Um, and they didn't want to, you know, offend any of the people that they were that they were allies with and that seems to kind of be happening more and more and i think russia is another good example of something kind of like that also um so it's just become overly diplomatic but like to the point of being a doormat it's just not doing what it was intended to do and it ignores the things that the body has sworn that they will not ignore, that they will not ignore, and and they have refused to uphold things that they swore that they would <laughs> uphold. So, it just doesn't make any sense anymore. Sorry, I thought I had myself muted there. Started coughing like crazy and realized my mic was open. All right. <laughs> That's well, okay. I mean, honestly, we've known for a while that the UN was inept. It's one of the reasons why, you know, when Trump started making all this noise about how he was going to defund them and do this, do that, it was one of the few, the few things that he said that I liked. Um, and so far, he has done absolutely bupkis with it. Um, well, other than ignore them and do things on his own, which, I mean, you know, again, you can... You can like that. You can lump it. What scares me about the Syria thing, and then we'll move on to the uh, the breaking news story that I just found. Well, semi breaking, breaking for us anyway. It's been going out now for about three hours. But um, here's the thing with Syria: if you listen to the folks that used to have roles in intelligence about this same time last week, when all of this really started. Well, I say this time last week. It was about two days later, but about you know what, five days ago. When all of this uh, spun off and everybody's like at dinner watching us basically bomb the heck out of an airfield in Syria, um, all the intelligence, former intelligence talking heads were coming out saying things like, well, nobody's going to go to war over Syria. This isn't that big a deal. This is just Trump trying to prove to Assad that he can't keep doing the things that he was doing while Obama was president and blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Except now their language is changing and their language is changing because they've noticed something very scary. Iran and Russia are on the same page when it comes to this Syrian attack, and they're not viewing it as an attack against Assad. They're using language like this was an attack against us. This was a line that has been crossed. So all of these same people that this time last week were like, oh, there's nothing to worry about. Nobody's going to go to war over Syria are now sitting here with their mouths agape going, holy crap, what did we just do? Yeah. I just, I think that they're... This whole this whole scenario and and going ahead and doing this, I have also watched how there were so many people saying, "Have did you see those videos? Did you see the pictures of those children? Have you watched any of this? Oh, the humanity! How on earth we someone has to do something about this? Well, but then it's Trump. So then what was it? How dare you do something like that? <laughs> and 
then, you know, then there were reports that somehow there were some civilians there and several children in there among the deceased, which I'm just not sure I buy. There's not really a good way for us to verify, um, or at least there wasn't in the immediate aftermath. If they were, then they put them there because what on earth were several civilians and several children doing at a remote airfield in the middle of the night? Well, I mean, if they were there at all, it was likely because they, they wanted it in there. Um that's what I mean. They put them there so that they could then say that that would be the only way that that's actually true. They're not just hanging out <laughs> this in this airfield. It's just ridiculous. But that, you know, it was one of those things where everybody was crying for something to be done. And then the second something is done, it's either a not good enough or B um, was the wrong thing to do. And how dare he? And now he's going to start a nuclear war. I mean, that's those are the kind of the extremes that everything gets, you know people jump to. Yeah, I mean, and again, I don't know what's going to happen with it, but all I know is when people that I know that have had intelligence backgrounds have suddenly done a 180 based on chatter, it's starting to make me a little nervous. Um, speaking of things that have are, that are making me nervous, I really am starting to figure out if the FBI even knows what it's doing because I seem to remember. Folks in the FBI stating that none of the Trump uh, Trump administration or Trump transition team was ever under any type of surveillance. Well, uh, guess what? The Washington Post has now confirmed, in the words of Maury Povich, that was a lie. FBI obtained FISA warrant to monitor Trump advisor Carter Page. The FBI obtained a secret court order last summer to monitor the communications of an advisor to president, presidential candidate Donald Trump, part of an investigation into possible links between Russia and the campaign law enforcement and other U.S. officials said. The FBI and the Justice Department obtained the warrant targeting Carter Page's communications after convincing a Foreign Intelligence Service Court judge that there was probable cause to believe Page was acting as an agent of a foreign power, in this case Russia, according to the officials. In the clearest evidence so far that the FBI had reason to believe during the 2016 presidential campaign that a Trump campaign advisor was in touch with Russian agents, such contacts are now at the center of an investigation into whether the campaign coordinated with the Russian government to swing the election into Trump's favor. And then it, of course, goes on from there. But I'm confused. I thought we weren't monitoring any of Trump's people. Oh, boy. I mean, if this is actually being confirmed, this is a... Uh... This is a big pile to step in, actually. Um, just because it all along people were saying it's not so much that it would be directly monitoring Trump himself. It was, you know, other people. But then that would mean that if they were monitoring certain people, that they could also be getting some of his communications, obviously, that would come across. I'm just trying to get um, a straight answer. Like, did that you person answer stuff? Hang on a second. I think thanks to Jess, we have some audio. You've she audio. Real quick. Hang on. I didn't get a chance to vet this, but she says that's what it is. So let's give it a listen. It's about 23 seconds. Hey, Kislock, in Cleveland, did you talk to him? I, I'm not going to deny that. And this I is from to MSNBC on the third of said, March. I will say that I never met him anywhere uh, outside of Cleveland. Let's let's just so say that much. The only time that you met him was in Cleveland. I, 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 what, that I may have met him, possibly, what it might have been in Cleveland. So okay. Uh, again, I'm. Hang on. Let's hear that again. I think I missed something. I'm just trying to get a straight answer. Like, did you meet Sergey Kislock in Cleveland? Did you talk to him? I, I'm not going to deny that I talked with him. Although so you did I will talk to say, him. I will say that I never met him anywhere uh, outside of Cleveland. Let's let's just so say that much. The only time that you met him was in Cleveland. I, 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 what, that I may have met him, possibly, what it might have been in Cleveland. So, okay. uh, again, so I'm, for we're... those of you who are wondering, I do believe that is actual audio of Carter Page. From MSNBC on March 3rd. Oh, wow. I mean, look, again, I've, I've said from the beginning, all I, all I want to know is the truth. Because here's the thing. No matter what's happened, we need to know how deeply another government was involved in our election. Whether it was to push things in Trump's direction, push things in Hillary's direction, whatever the case may have been. All of that, to me, for the moment, is irrelevant. I want to know if things like this have happened so that we can make sure they don't happen again. But the naivete to think that us, the same people that apparent, that stick our nose in other people's elections processes every single day, to think that we, we're, we seem to be shocked that another foreign power would be meddling in ours seems 
kind of egregious to me to to think that we are that um that we are that prideful to be honest because i mean th- th- this is the way things are done now it, it ha- it's the way we've done things i mean the obama administration tried to meddle in the israeli israeli election nobody was talking about that and how terrible it was but now that the russians may have been involved in ours it's completely terrible and things must be done and we need to find the truth and I understand it because it's different when it touches your own home. But at the same time, why is it we can't get a straight answer? Because I specifically remember the FBI saying that no one in the Trump administration or the Trump transition team or anything to do with any part of candidate Trump's people was ever under any direct surveillance. And yet here we have evidence to the contrary. Yeah, and I think this is going to get a whole lot messier before we ever get any kind of real clear picture of what was going on here and why and i mean we may never get the complete picture but there's now enough here where you really have to start wondering because remember we had talked about this being a i mean this this whole syria thing whether you want to admit it or not even though there was an actual target involved this time it reminds me very much of clinton throwing cruise missiles into an aspirin factory because there were two very important things that were going on around that time. He was he was under review for impeachment by the Senate. And at the same time, there was a story that to this day, nobody really talks about that broke in the news the day that he threw the, the, the cruise missiles at that aspirin factory. And that was the fact that we now have incontrovertible proof that through the CIA, we were actually involved in the drug trade in the 80s. That story broke that day. And nobody caught it because we were too busy talking about Bill Clinton throwing cruise missiles at an aspirin factory. Yeah, that is also crazy. But I and you are right, though. Um, and it's also the reason why something like it's a lot of people initially were like, "Ooh, is this illegal for him to do? And can he be impeached? And he didn't get congressional approval and yada, yada, yada. What he did, which is not also unlike what some things that Obama did, but um, were have some very rooted precedents um, that have been ruled on um, in favor of the president uh, from Clinton's era. So I knew that that wasn't really going to be an issue. Maybe it should be. Maybe it technically is unconstitutional. Maybe it should be approved by Congress. But there is precedence um, from the 90s saying that that isn't necessary and it's within the president's um, power. Actually, it goes all the way back to the War Powers Act of 1973. Well, yes, it does. There was just a couple things that he did that went over that and that were then defended in court and upheld. So you're just really not going to – you're not going to get – you're not going to nail him on this. There's just no way. (laughs) No, I mean honestly there's not. I mean my issue with the War Powers Act is yes, it enumerates things very clearly. It says that as long as the – the powers that be are notified within 48 hours of any action. The president then has 60 days to use whatever force he deems necessary to await Congress's approval. If approval is not given, then there is then a 30 day withdrawal window. All military action personnel in the area and all other activities must stop by the end of that 30 day period. I get all of that. And I understand that that's basically what he was using was the war powers act of 1973. But my question is, Because the Constitution specifically says nobody but Congress can declare war. So why has nobody challenged the the legality of the War Powers Act of 1973? Because by throwing cruise missiles into a foreign country, did not the president just technically declare war even if Congress comes back later and says, "Eh, never mind, just kidding, we're not going to let him do that. Right, and not only that, but uh, with the way it's all spelled out, as long as Congress eventually does declare before there are actually boots on the ground, there's not really going to be much dispute about it. But that's the thing. Even if they dispute it and come back and say, hey, you know what? Not Just, just kidding. Ignore those cruise missiles we threw at you. We're not really declaring war. I mean, isn't that kind of like trying to put the cat back in the bag or the chicken back in the egg? <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. It just I don't, I don't understand how that can technically be constitutional. And it, I'm, the thing about it is nobody's going to challenge it because – and I've, I've actually talked about this a bit with a with an attorney that you all know that does a show here on KLR and in other places, uh, Gene 
Gerardelli. Uh, I always say his name wrong. He's going to shoot me one of these days for getting it wrong. Um, but he was talking about the fact that nobody's going to challenge the War Powers Act of 1973 because then at that point you actually have to go back and challenge parts of the Constitution, which is what that was basically written around. So, I mean, I don't know. It could be, it could be something that stands for forever, but I'm honestly surprised that nobody's at least tried to say anything about it or do anything directly um, with the Supreme Court in regards to that particular law. But then again, like you said, parts parts of this have been challenged before and things that have even been considered slightly outside of the scope of the WPA were actually deemed to be completely legal. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess warmonger is going to warmonger. I don't, I don't think we're ever going to get rid of that, whether we want to or not. Yeah, I don't think so either. All right. Well, not any time in the foreseeable future, and especially not with the... Uh, Oh, craptastic world relations we have now. <laughs> you said craptastic. I did. <laughs> All right. Well, we've got about three minutes left before we really have to shut things down so I can start getting ready for off the rails. Anything else you want to touch on on the way out the door? Oh, poor Sean Spicer. He just stepped right into a Holocaust nest. So if you have time, look that up because it's – obviously a misstep and a misspoke and you know he tried to clarify and just made it worse but they've released a statement he didn't say that the holocaust doesn't exist so stop saying he's a denier uh he just worded some things wrong and and it it was bad but um <laughs> uh just one more thing just one more thing well i mean let's face it he's had what about a half a dozen missteps in his little over 100 days as the press secretary so mm -hmm. is, it, is this mm -hmm. really, is this really anything new hey wait we have audio of sean spicer so let's hear what this says you, you look we didn't use chemical weapons in world war ii you know you had a you know someone as despicable as hitler who didn't even sink to the to the to using chemical weapons Hey, Sean, what the hell is a gas chamber? I know, I know, it's so funny. I, but you know what I did really, I loved this tweet by Essie Cup. She said, Pepsi, be glad you're not United. United, be glad you're not Spicer. Spicer, be glad you're not Hitler? <laughs> oh my God. I mean, ser seriously, <laughs> Hit Hitler did not use chemical weapons. Uh, Sean, he gassed. Millions of I Jews. Know. Well, he <laughs> clarified later that what he meant was not, you know, in the field and on people just like dropped like bombs. Obviously, it was in the concentration camps. And I think when I listened to it again and then actually part of the clarification, I think that with that in mind, you go, no, I, I get what he was saying. But it just did not <laughs> come out right. He didn't explain it right. And then he said, not their own people. Uh, which then enraged people saying, like, you don't think the Jews are people? You don't think the Jews were Germans? So uh, it was just outrage all around to be had. Oh, it's just craziness. I mean, I know. I mean, dude, it, 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 as crazy it, as it was to watch the mental backflips of the Obama administration, the Obama, the Obama administration ain't going to have nothing on the Trump administration, apparently. No, I don't think so. I think uh, we're they're going to keep serving these up daily. <laughs> and, and folks, for those of you that are wondering, that was not a compliment. We are now watching the Monty Python of presidencies unfold in front of our eyes. And I'm not sure that's going to be a good thing. Just saying. <laughs> All right, so we are officially out of time, as we do every time on the way out the door. Why don't you remind folks where they can in <coughs> interact with you when you're not on the radio listening to me try to ad-lib crazy things about airlines. <laughs> sure, you can come find me at Jay Homestead on Twitter, where I spend most of my time. Also, JR Homestead on Facebook. And check out uh, my website with some smart people, misfitspolitics.com. All right, and I, of course, am Rick Robinson. Uh, we do the show every Tuesday and Thursday at 10 Eastern, 9 Central. It's also on the Lanterns Radio Network, usually airing on Wednesdays and Fridays at 3 p.m. Eastern, I think. Um, and then, of course, I'm also on America Off the Rails every Sunday through Thursday at 11 p.m. right here on KLRRadio.com. You can interact with me on Twitter. It is actually one of the best ways to do it. It's AOTR underscore host. I also do have a Facebook profile that I use for professional reasons. You can find that one simply by searching Rick Robinson on Facebook. Look for the picture uh, that looks like the little 
dude that's pretending he's on the cover of Time Magazine. No, I'm not pretentious. I just thought it was a cute picture. Um, and you can interact with me there. Shoot me a friend's request. We'll talk. We'll chat. We'll, we'll hang out. If you're old school, you can use email. You can email me at rick at klrnradio.com. And actually, I, I did want to mention this on the way out the door. I just got confirmation from Ann, station manager Ann. She will no longer be booking any KLR and radio staff on United Airlines. She wanted to make sure that people knew that. <laughs> <laughs> And we are out, folks. Take care. God bless. Have a good night. And again, Pepsi, be glad you're not United. United, be glad you're not Spicer. Spicer, give it up. You suck. Go away. Good night. <laughs> I'm not ready to end the fight. I'm not ready to back down. Because I've been through hell and I don't have time to go round and round and round. It's too late to turn back now. If I could Cause I'm proud as hell I can't bring myself to do what it is You think I should